The biggest misunderstanding about ASU is that we're just another public university, just the latest one to come into the uh, railroad yard. We're far from that. I really think that ASU under President Crow is reinventing higher education. There aren't a lot of people who think the way we think, and people find that very attractive and interesting. That learning opportunity really is unique, and we think very impactful. We're not here to win anybody over. We're not here to make the case. We're not here to take a side. Uh, what we're here for is uh, let's solve the problems that our country has. We don't view D.C. as a place that should be a political battlefield. We see D.C. as a place where people should come together with different ideas and organize them towards solutions to specific challenges that we're facing. In order to do this, you need to walk the halls of the Congress. We need to be with the international development agencies. We need to be potentially with the corporates, think tanks. And then ASU becomes this convening power of bringing this all together as we devise solutions to grand challenge problems. So a presence in D.C. is really valuable because it helps people see what we're doing and it helps them appreciate the, and understand the importance of the institution, not just as a university out there in the desert, but also as a place that's affecting change in, in the nation's capital. You know, I'm most proud in D.C. that we have real programs. We have figured out how to project learning from uh, an active, engaged research community with partners I love the fact that, that by partnering with ASU, we have access to ASU students. Washington is typically a place where you go and aspire after you've been working for years and years and sometimes for decades. Well, this is an opportunity for our Cronkite students to spend a semester in Washington and, and be working side by side with some of the best journalists in the world. There's fabulous student opportunities here. You have to be creative. Um, you have to be uh, willing to, to kind of invent your own career. Um, but I think what we've found with our alums who have come to Washington is that there are fantastic opportunities. We're there to teach, to learn, to partner, to discover. We really do have a seat at the table. We're participating in conversations with think tanks. We're helping to build the research agenda with agencies. Thank you, Chairman Flake. My name is uh, Jamie Winterton. I'm the Director of Strategy at Arizona State University's Global Security Initiative. And we're being seen as leaders that Washington, D.C. can pull in to help them solve these big problems. You know, it's kind of amazing now. You tell people you're at ASU and, and uh, they say, oh, I've heard of that. That's amazing what's going on in there. ASU begins to be recognized as this very special place for thinking about the world in, in new, powerful ways that can solve problems that uh, otherwise we've had trouble solving. It's all about concentrating on what is our central role, which is we create the future. That's what we do. And we want to be in Washington to find partners to be able to do that better. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Alfredo Artiles. I'm the Dean of the Graduate College at ASU. Uh, in partnership with the Council of Graduate Schools, we're proud to host today's event. I want to acknowledge CGS President Dr. Susana Ortega, who is joining us this morning, as well as Dr. Jennifer Kaysen, who, uh, whose team has led a lot of the work on knowledge mobilization we have been doing for the last year and a half at ASU. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to call attention to the uh, materials you have. Make sure that you review them. Some of them are related to the graduate college initiatives. And also, I want to you have a program for the event, as well as an, a feedback form. Please take a minute before you leave to give us feedback. We'll collect it at, um, at the end of the event. Today's session will address the growing need for researchers to produce knowledge about problems that matter and the attendance requirement to generate research that makes a difference. These demands have emerged in the age of knowledge power. Today's expectation is not only to possess knowledge, but also to use it with a demonstrable impact. At a time when debates about the notion and roles of evidence are taking place in scientific and public spheres, knowledge use for impact is indeed a major imperative for universities and for the ways researchers are prepared. 
We will share with you today the ASU Graduate College's initiative to respond to these demands through the use of knowledge mobilization. But before I describe our work in the histor uh, I will briefly locate our work in the historical trends that have transformed the demands and expectations of researchers. At least three trends have shaped how researchers are expected to approach the production and uses of knowledge. First, we're living in an era of unprecedented knowledge production. Whereas it took about 100 years in the early 20th century to double the amount of knowledge, the advent of globalization and technological innovation, such as the internet, have reduced this time to about 12 hours. As a commentator recently stated, there has never been a time in human history when we have searched for so much data, information, and knowledge. At the same time, there has never been a time when we have gathered so much information that is useful, but not used. Second, as Donald Stokes' analysis suggested a number of years ago, the role of research production in relation to technological progress and societal transformation has also shifted. This means researchers are expected to produce basic and applied research while making research knowledge accessible, engaging, and impactful. This requirement takes on a greater urgency at a global level. Given the rise of inequality across regions of the world, and what the UNESCO report on the social sciences described as knowledge divides. The report findings suggest that, quote, without conscious and coordinated effort, the drift of the global science landscape is towards fragmentation, lack of pluralism, and estrangement between scientific endeavor and social needs. And third, these trends have created conditions for a paradigm shift in the preparation of researchers. The traditional ivory tower model of higher education in which researchers are solely concerned with producing knowledge to advance our understanding of the subject through a single disciplinary lens is no longer viable. As Karl Popper remarked almost 60 years ago, we're not students of some subject matter, but students of problems. And problems may cut right across the borders of any subject matter of discipline or discipline. Indeed, the demand for use-oriented research has increased significantly. Knowledge mobilization has emerged as a useful tool to engage productively with these trends and demands. Knowledge mobilization is concerned, marks the link between knowledge production and social change, between the academy and the public it serves. Moreover, knowledge mobilization is all, captures the set of concepts and practices that optimize access and use of knowledge and creative work. That is, knowledge mobilization transcends the traditional, proper, technical implementation of research. It also compels researchers to be mindful of knowledge user communities so that their knowledge is accessible, used, and impactful to solve real life problems. There is a growing interest on knowledge mobilization. After pioneering work in Canada and Europe, Several efforts have become increasingly visible in the United States. Examples include CGS's Grand, Grad Impact Initiative. I trust that Suzanne will share more information with us today about that. The Knowledge Mobilization Initiative at York University. The Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University. The Research Impact Consortium of 12 universities in Canada. And the Engagement Scholarship Consortium. These efforts vary in their goals and scope. Their purpose for, communication, for communicating science might vary from increasing our understanding of the science related to a problem to influencing people's opinions, behavior, and policy preferences to engaging alternative perspectives about science related to important social issues as a means to find solutions to societal problems that affect everyone. Despite this variability, most initiatives share a commitment to communicate scientific knowledge for maximizing impact. In short, then we have seen that knowledge mobilization is an emerging institutional infrastructure designed to maximize the impact of academic research on public policy and professional practice. The ASU Graduate College started recently to infuse knowledge mobilization in its P, uh, professional development programmatic efforts. Our work is situated in the unprecedented project to transform American higher education that is taking place at ASU. 
Our university has reframed its education model to be defined by its adaptability, its commitment to innovation, scalability, and technology-enabling investments. Our pledge to build excellence in diversity and inclusion is an unprecedented social experiment. Equally important, the university's design aspirations permeate the work of the Graduate College in Knowledge Mobilization, particularly the concern with transforming society, fusing intellectual disciplines, and social embeddedness. I should note that our Knowledge Mobilization Initiative is mindful of the institutional context of knowledge production at ASU, and thus, it has benefited from the culture that these design aspirations have forged at ASU over the last 15 years. Prominent in this new culture are the attention to interdisciplinarity, tackling problems of social significance, and research for impact. To illustrate, the total value of active sponsor projects from single units between 2003 and 2014 increased 61%, while the value of projects involving more than one unit increased in the same time period 259%. The postdoctoral fellows feature in the video you will see in a few minutes, and all the panelists embody the distinctive cultural identity of ASU. Although the Graduate College Knowledge Mobilization Initiative cannot take credit for this individual's strong commitment to knowledge mobilization, their achievements constitute a compelling testimony about the legacy of the ASU design aspirations and the values and practices that characterize our initiative. Our knowledge mobilization work strives to break down institutional walls particularly disciplinary borders. We're creating opportunities for graduate students and postdoctoral fellows <clears throat> to participate in interdisciplinary learning ecologies in which it is acceptable to be comfortable with uncertainty. Or as MacArthur fellow Liz Lerman, who is actually there dancing, put it, to engage in interdisciplinary learning activities in which it is customary being comfortable with discomfort. By assembling groups from disparate disciplines, we anticipate these individuals will create a sort of what Peter Gallison described as trading zones, the processes of interdisciplinary collaboration that scientists construct to communicate and solve problems. Sustain interactions with fellow researchers that do not share theoretical or methodological perspectives, or even disciplinary affinities create productive learning dissonances as participants labor to make their research accessible and usable and maximize the impact of their work. The requirement for what Crow and Dabars describe as mutual intelligibility, in this case across knowledge producers and users, is a central requirement of knowledge mobilization work. For this purpose, we are offering professional and career development opportunities to graduate students and postdoctoral fellows through seminars called the Knowledge Mobilization Studio and PFX, we're also creating incentives to recognize and disseminate knowledge mobilization efforts with the KM Awards. And we're getting ready to launch Traveling Knowledge Stories. We can share more details about these efforts and CGS's Grant Impact Initiative during the Q&A portion of today's event. What differentiates our knowledge mobilization initiative is its interdisciplinary culture and commitment to innovation. We animate participants to cross disciplinary and paradigmatic borders, even beyond the academy since universities lost their monopoly as the exclusive site of knowledge production. Grow comfortable about communicating with audiences that do not share standpoints or jargon, take risks when representing their knowledge, and leverage serendipity in their knowledge mobilization efforts. Before I introduce the panel, I will show a short video to introduce this idea of knowledge mobilization and bring the concept to life with two stories from postdoctoral fellows working at ASU. The ASU Graduate College continually improves the resources we provide to our graduate students and postdoctoral fellows so that they have the knowledge, dispositions, and skills required to succeed in the 21st century. The ASU Graduate College strives to equip graduate students and postdoctoral fellows with transferable skills that are needed in today's career markets. We are concerned with the so what question about researchers' labor and the knowledge they produce. Why would or should people outside the academy think that research findings matter? What difference is research making in people's lives or in reducing problems or challenges of social significance? 
Knowledge mobilization is concerned with making the insights and solutions discovered by researchers accessible and usable. How can we document that such knowledge made an impact on the lives of these people? The stories you're about to see illustrate what knowledge mobilization looks like in real life. The problem that we, we try to tackle with our work is how can we improve fishing sustainability and also improve or at least maintain the livelihoods of fishermen. Small scale fisheries are poorly regulated. They incur a lot of what is called bycatch and bycatch is any animal that, that gets caught in a fishing net that wasn't intended to be captured. And in Baja where I work, a lot of the bycatch includes endangered species such as sea turtles, sharks, whales. What really inspired this work for me was when I was a master's student at the University of Florida, I was studying sea turtle biology and I was tracking the movements of sea turtles. You have to look into the eyes of a sea turtle. There's something so spiritual about it. This is an animal that's been around for 200 million years. Over the course of a two week span, I ended up tracking countless turtles to their deaths. And these turtles were ending up drowning in fishing nets. One day a fisherman came and brought me a turtle that we had been tracking. And I know he could have sold that and gotten a lot of money for that, but instead wanted it to bring it to me. And so I, I looked at that as an opportunity to engage fishermen and bring them into my research project and make them essentially become part of our team and help us design different solutions that can protect turtles, but also that can improve their livelihoods. And so one day I was out, we were out catching sea turtles and tracking sea turtles, middle of the day, and I saw a sea turtle swim right up to a net, noticed the net and turned right around. And so that led to my idea to place lights on fishing nets. The LEDs illuminate the net at night, and so it provides a visual cue for the sea turtle to see that net and then avoid becoming entangled in the net. Simply by putting these lights on fishing nets, we caught 50% fewer sea turtles and 95% fewer sharks. What I found though from my PhD research was the batteries only lasted one to two weeks. And so for the average fisherman, that would have been two to 400 AA batteries potentially per week. So what I did was I teamed up with ASU engineers who specialized in solar power and kinetic energy. And I basically asked them, how can we develop a solution to power these lights with renewable energy? That has really helped me mobilize my knowledge because if I was at a smaller school or a school that didn't advocate for interdisciplinary research like ASU, it would be much harder to do this work. This is the future of fisheries. In 50 years from now, I can imagine every coastal community on this planet fishing with solar powered nets. Given my background in kinesiology, uh, I learned a lot about exercise and exercise physiology and the importance of being active in order to maintain health and reduce your risk for diabetes. Energy in equals energy out. And so you look at a problem like obesity and diabetes and just think, man, why can't they exercise more and eat less? This would solve the problem. The problem that we address with our research is diabetes risk in Latino youth and families. Not a whole lot of work has been done around diabetes prevention for the families, specifically for Latino families. Latino youth are disproportionately burdened by diabetes. They are the most insulin resistant subgroup. Early in 2012, we had actually started partnering with the YMCA to test this intervention as a diabetes prevention intervention for Latino adolescents. This was a rigorous clinical trial and so a very controlled environment, but we did find that the program did lead to significant improvements in diabetes risk. Our work is really important in that we take our diabetes prevention programs and we adapt it to the culture. Out of our 160 participants, over 50% of them were coming from Maryvale. As soon as you step into Maryvale, you feel the culture. It's still a close-knit, connected community um, where the Hispanic Latino culture is, is prevalent. And one of the critical values uh, for that culture is family. And so we really saw this need to take uh, this program sort of out of the confines of this rigor and this clinical trial and move it to the community uh, where it's needed. 
So Viva Maryvale is a family-centered diabetes prevention program for Latino families in Maryvale, Arizona, and it is conducted in partnership with some wonderful community folks here in the Valley, uh, starting with the Valley of the Sun YMCA, um, who really lends their expertise in fitness instruction and they serve as the site for the project. Patients are identified and enrolled into the program. They participate in a pre-intervention assessment, which is led by our team here at ASU, and then they enter this 12-week lifestyle intervention, where they go to nutrition education class for one time a week for 60 minutes, and the parents must attend. And there they learn things about fats and carbs, and they set family goals. And then three times a week, they go to a physical activity session, uh, which is led by trained physical activity instructors at the YMCA. And then once the 12-week program is done, we send them back to the medical provider so that they can see their results, talk about their progress through the program, and establish a future plan of care. I think our knowledge exchange with our participants is bi-directional. That feedback is critical uh, for guiding the, the development of the intervention. We've seen significant reductions in diabetes risk in our adults. For our youth, we've also seen significant reductions in their body composition. And then as a whole, we've seen this improvement in quality of life. We know that there are other vulnerable communities like Maryvale, and we know that the need for diabetes prevention is also statewide. So our vision is that we can reach these communities in other areas throughout the state. To me, knowledge mobilization means taking the knowledge and the research that is generated here in the academic institution, taking it out to the community. For us, the power in our knowledge mobilization is through partnership, and so partnering with the other organizations and community stakeholders uh, who can help us get this knowledge uh, to the folks, get it from the research to the ground and to the folks who are going to use it. Thank you. Inspiring stories indeed. I hope that by now we have a better sense of what we mean by knowledge mobilization prepare graduate students and postdoc fellows for the rigors of conducting research, but also make sure that they are mindful of the need to make that knowledge accessible, engage people, users in the use of that knowledge, and making sure that they measure in the impact. A number of people in this room who went through PhD programs a number of years ago did not necessarily have that experience as part of our training. I certainly did not have that experience in preparing for my own research. But we're now moving to the richer segment of today's event. We're fortunate to have two doctoral students and an ASU alumnus on the panel. I'll briefly introduce each panelist, but there are bios in the event program for a more detailed description of each participant's interests and backgrounds. I'm going to introduce all of them, and then they will make their presentations in that order. Dr. Karen Gallagher earned her PhD in speech and hearing science in the ASU College of Health Solutions in 2017. She's currently a clinical associate professor at ASU. She'll describe how her research and knowledge mobilization efforts aim to empower veterans. <clears throat> Peter Martin is a doc doctoral candidate in animal behavior in the ASU School of Life Sciences. He studied how collective personalities shaped and maintained in ant colonies. Peter will defend his dissertation this semester. Looks pretty relaxed to me. <clears throat> His presentation will feature how he's using the arts to communicate his research to broader audiences. Emily Sarka is a doctoral candidate in British Romantic Literature with a focus on the Gothic. Emily will also defend her dissertation this semester. She'll share with us her work on the historical fluctuations in popularity and prevalence of different kinds of monsters as a lens through which to gauge popular reactions to change. Each panelist prepare a five-minute presentation to outline the key points from their work. Next, I will have a brief conversation with the panel to expand on some of their central aspects of their work, and we'll leave plenty of time for interaction with all of you. Welcome, Karen, Peter, and Emily, and we all look forward to learning about your work. Thank you. Thank you. So this is Joshua. Joshua is a combat engineer in the Army and has deployed several times uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan. And in the context of his deployments, he has sustained some injuries, specifically mild traumatic brain injuries or concussions, a few of them. And he kind of did okay. Joshua did okay while he was still in the structure of the military. But when he left 
the military and transitioned to civilian life, to college. That's when he ended up coming to me. You see, he said, something is wrong with the way that my brain works. I need help. I went to VA and they wrote me a prescription, actually eight prescriptions. You see, because they tested him with the same tests that they use to test people with very severe brain injuries. And they found nothing and told him it was psychiatric, eight prescriptions. Joshua is not unlike so many veterans transitioning out of the military. Approximately 200,000 transition out every year for the past few years and the next few years. And of them, about a third will have sustained a brain injury, with the vast majority being mild traumatic brain injuries. And even uh, according to the DOD, this is a low estimate because they largely go unreported. About 44% will also have a diagnosis of PTS. And these numbers don't tell the whole story, but what they do tell us is that we are failing a large number of our military veterans. This is me. I'm Karen Gallagher, and this is not okay with me. And I decided I needed to look at this. I needed to know why. What's going on in this transition process with these veterans? And so I started to research it. I started to look at it and try to investigate and develop some tests that might be sensitive to their subtle deficits. You see, this is personal to me. That's me, not a 12-year-old boy. That is, in fact, me. Right before I deployed to war, I was US Army Airborne Nuclear Biological Chemical Specialist. And I had my own transition issues when I got out of the military. And I didn't know how to make the adjustments. You see, when I was in, you trained me how to succeed in a, a desert environment. You trained me how to deal with the culture. You gave me a mission and you gave me a team and I knew how to succeed. But when I got out, when Joshua got out, we didn't get that, none of us did. So I developed the Veteran Cognition and Academic Success Project where I took on this question of what's really going on in these transitioning veterans and how can we better help them. And I got to work. I got to work with Joshua and a lot of veterans, hundreds of them at ASU, other campuses. They find me, they seek me out because they go to VA and say something's wrong with the way that my brain works and they get written prescriptions when they want help. So I developed some tests that are sensitive to these and I developed, it wasn't enough, I didn't want to stop there. I also developed an approach to help these veterans succeed in civilian life by learn, getting the training they need, the memory strategy training they need to succeed by learning how to define their own mission and how to identify their team by being connected with resources that matter and that impact their lives. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. I got great feedback from veterans saying, I wish I had found you last semester. You know, I, I, I now have a 3.0 when I was failing. And I wanted to take this, this knowledge, what I had found, and I wanted to get it on the road. I wanted to get it out there to other researchers, to practitioners, to VA. And so I did. I took my message on the road and I presented at international conferences. I went to the media. I, I had news stories done. I gave interviews, lots of interviews. I published my findings in uh, peer-reviewed academic journals. I even went to politicians and I discussed what these findings were and what needed to happen to better transition our military veterans. I wanted everyone to have access to the knowledge I found. I wanted them to be able to use this knowledge to really impact our veterans' lives as they're making this big transition. So I'm Karen Gallagher. I have the Veteran Cognition and Academic Success Project and I am focused on training veterans in how to survive and succeed in the civilian world, how to define their own mission, and how to define their own team. Thank you. Being a scientist, a basic scientist, is exhilarating. We dedicate our blood, sweat, and tears sometimes to uncover small hidden mysteries of the world that we live in using rigorous techniques and quantitative tools. 
And our mission is to share these small advancements, these small contributions to the world to enrich the awe and knowledge in society. And the way that we do this primarily is through a document like this, which is for scientists, a beautiful tool to engage with other scientists in an unbiased way to communicate our results. But to the public, it's a very ob obtruse, very opaque, hard to get through, really difficult to understand, and inaccessible. Probably 12 scientists will read this, and nobody from the public will. If we want to take it further, we can take our research on the road with wordy posters at conferences for other scientists, which again is great to communicate our results for scientists. But scientists ourselves at this level are really creative people. You have to be creative to be able to generate these hypotheses, make sense of your observations, design tools to ask questions. And so to take advantage of this problem, or sorry, to solve this problem of communicating our results to the public, the solution I've created is a curriculum that I train scientists to use art to express their own research. I call it artistic expression of original research, where I train scientists to tell the narrative of their research, create something beautiful, and express their emotions. And this is important because typically scientists uh, engage with their data using rationale and logical dimensions. But here, we introduce an aesthetic dimension, which can connect people with emotions, which is really how people learn and how people stick that knowledge and remember things. So here's the program in action. We have scientists, graduate students, postdocs, technicians. And here we have Russell, who is displaying his prototype neuron that he just 3D printed uh, to a class. We brainstorm our research, come up with prototypes. We invite professional artists and designers to share their techniques and give direct feedback to the students. Students go through iterations of their projects using many different techniques, all different kinds of media, and the results are stunning, just as beautiful and diverse as the research behind them. And we display this research in a public gallery, downtown Phoenix and the first Friday Art Walk and a prominent gallery in the Art District where on the opening night we received over a thousand public walkers by, where research, researchers stood by their art pieces explaining their research, why it's important and why people should care, which was an incredible experience both for the scientists and for the audience, breaking the mold of the stereotype of an antisocial lab-wearing scientist and getting them out to the public. I like to illustrate this using an example from my own work. I study these beautiful Cecropia trees. If you look closely, you can see they are teeming with ants. These are Azteca ants. They're very fierce. They protect the tree from things like herbivores, katydids, grasshoppers, vines even. But they don't do it for free. The tree provides them with nutrients by way of these little food bodies. And if you slice the tree open, you can see it's hollow and the, the ants actually live inside of the tree. If you shake the tree, the ants will pour out in defense. And where my research comes in is I study the difference in behavior of the collective. You can see this tree on the right, after I've shaken it, has a much stronger response than the tree on the left. And these are colonies of the same size, the same height. They have different collective personalities. So I wanted to express the narrative of this collective personality using the beautiful structure of the tree and expressing this emotion of almost a magical interactive piece by shaking the tree you can see the ants come out so i created tree of the glowing symbiont where i have the lights of this tree synchronized with the patrolling data of the ants on the tree and because i'm looking at 
the difference between colonies, I created a whole forest. Five trees in total where the audience can walk amongst the trees and see the difference in behavior of those ants themselves. I don't even have to explain them. They can see the blinking patterns between the trees are different. And my favorite part is you can walk up to these trees and I've outfitted them with a vibrational sensor. So you can shake the trees and they respond with the data of the colonies that actually responded to the vibration. So through this example, uh, it's been shown to have a lot of impact on the public, it was shown in a gallery for four months in Phoenix. And I can see this program uh, being, it, it has been institutionalized at ASU, now being offered every fall semester um, for scientists. And I could see this program being offered at other major universities uh, across the US and across the world. Thank you. My name is Emily Zarka, and I'm a monster expert. I believe there is no better barometer of the values and fears of our society than the monsters our cultures create. From racial violence, to the scientific history of anatomy, the lingering effects of terrorism and nuclear war to artificial intelligence. The horror genre provides us with progressive, provocative narratives. Yet there seems to be something about these kinds of texts that makes them unworthy of serious conversation. Critics beginning as early as the 18th century with harsh reviews of Gothic literature and continuing today with the negative reviews of horror films, there's an unfortunate historical precedence for this oversight. Critics are apt to point out plot holes, accuse texts of unnecessary violence and gore, even attribute to them the corruption of youth. And most significantly, people look at monsters and think they're one dimensional, that they're ridiculous, but they are wrong. Failure to study monsters is to ignore the anxieties and desires that cause their creation in the first place. To study monsters is to examine the cultural narratives that contextualize large social issues in our society. My goal is to give people the access and knowledge to better understand how cultural narratives react and work in their everyday lives. The monster is a mirror, a reflection of what we value and whom or what we deem to be undesirable. I would like to argue that human history is in fact monster history. So I'm interested in all different kinds of monsters, but I'm particularly fascinated by the undead. Vampires, zombies, mummies, walking skeletons, the reanimated corpse is particularly significant because it most closely resembles the human body. Thus, when the living come in contact with such a creature, we are forced to acknowledge our own existences and identify our own monstrous qualities. Thus far, my work with the monsters has been incredibly successful. Um, and tracing the history of the vampire, I have identified the template for this character, and even this one, not in Bram Stoker's Dracula, but in the poetry of a woman named Charlotte Dacre in 1805. This reveals a feminine and feminist history of horror that has previously gone unrecognized. My work with zombies produced a chapter for an upcoming book, Race, Gender, and Sexuality in The Walking Dead. My chapter looks at the Walking Dead comic series as an insight into current US anxieties of race, gender, and sexuality as they intersect in the body of this woman, Michonne, and in particular, how her romantic relationships are portrayed in conjunction with a supposedly more heroic male protagonist. I wrote an article for Slate Magazine looking at the last 15 years of zombie films as a way to explain changing global opinions of science in our everyday lives. This publication received over 7,200 page views in less than a week. A link I tweeted of the article appeared in over 4,000 news feeds on that day. I'm always looking for new ways to teach history through monsters. So in addition to teaching upper level courses, my knowledge of the horror film has led me to be a reoccurring guest lecturer in four introductory film and media courses, each averaging 100 students. I'm an active participant in the Frankenstein Bicentennial Project, a two-year interdisciplinary effort by ASU to engage the public with Mary Shelley's most famous text. My contributions include this museum-style library exhibit, and I also provided annotations for a forthcoming MIT Press publication of Mary Shelley's text, which will be available for free online to the public. I've spoke at Laurel, 
I've spoken at a local horror convention, but I've also presented at seven international and national and international academic conferences. I even went to a local middle school this January and taught three classes of sixth graders about ancient Egyptian burial practices and social hierarchy using mummies. In the future, I hope to mobilize my knowledge of the monster to publish books for both public and scholarly audiences. But for the greatest impact, one day I'd like to have my own television show on a network like the History Channel or the Discovery Channel, where I would travel the globe visiting different countries and communities and exploring the unique monsters in their individual histories. With viewership reaching over a million people on each of these networks, such a project would expose a wide audience to the complex historical and social motivations that have caused every single culture since the beginning of time to create monstrous bodies. My work shows that there is an approachable way to engage everyone from children to academics in thoughtful conversation about larger social issues. The monster is a way to talk about poverty, racism, sexism, discrimination, and the social condition in a way that's exciting and approachable. To understand monstrosity is to understand humanity and to impact how it advances in the future. So I ask, what are you afraid of? Thank you. Thank you, Karen, Peter, and Emily. What a stunning representation of approaches to knowledge mobilization from sustainable fishing to community interventions for diabetes to critical analysis of monsters and holistic interventions for veterans and the fusing of arts with science. Very impressive uh, breadth of approaches to doing knowledge mobilization. What I would like to do next is to have a conversation with the panelists and then we'll switch to have a discussion with you as well. I'm sure you have a number of questions and comments. Uh, I would like to start with a question about border crossing. All of the examples we heard are concerned with fusing disciplines and connecting your own work with other disciplines to enrich and enhance access, use, and impact. Can you comment on how you thought about this approach of border crossing? Which disciplines did you think about putting together? How do you do that and why? Well, um, <clears throat> for me, the, uh, the obvious fusion here is the arts and the sciences and design. So the distinction between art and design classically is design is pursuit of function and solution and art is pursuit for its own sake. And here there's sort of a fusion of expressing science using a little bit of design in that you have a a target audience and you want to convey a message and a narrative and tell the story of your research uh, but you also want to infuse a bit of art too to really stretch that emotional and aesthetic dimension um, and, and embody some of who you are in, your, in the science and how you feel about that science in your end product. Uh, so that fusion um, has been really interesting working with uh, artists and designers at ASU and learning about how they approach uh, their issues. I think um, for, for me, some of that border crossing came at the intersection of clinical practice and research. Because oftentimes to get some research to clinical practice takes decades. And I don't feel that we have decades. So trying to make the research translational today was, was you know, by making it clinically relevant, um, not just researching you know, what's going on from a neurological perspective, but this more holistic approach um, and bringing in multiple disciplines, but also at a, at a clinical level immediately. Um, for me, I think there's a misconception that literary scholars, all we do is look at texts. We just look at novels and narratives and that's it. And maybe for some people, that's how they approach it. But for me, I truly think that we have to be interdisciplinary scholars. So for me, it's not about just being able to read literature. It's being able to talk about film and media studies, gender and sexuality studies, race theory, religion. I consider myself also a historian. I have to have at least a passing knowledge of the history of medicine, of science, of politics. Um, and I also have encountered medical texts in my work, um, art history, and sociology even. So I think that 
one great thing about literature and about looking at narrative in general is that it's there's stories in all of our lives. Each of us have our own story, and that's what leaves an impact on the world and on history. So we need to be able to understand that in as broad a text as possible. Thank you. Uh, I quoted in my presentation, Liz Lerner's challenge to researchers about being comfortable with ambiguity, uncertainty, and discomfort. According to the Keck Futures Initiative of the National Academy of Sciences, they concluded that when you do that, that's when intuition and imagination take over. As you enhance the interdisciplinary nature of your research and knowledge mobilization efforts, you likely faced various kinds of theoretical, methodological, and or disciplinary discomforts. Can you share an example and explain how you are learning to feel more comfortable with those moments and those instances? I, I certainly can. I, I think early on um, in looking at veterans and this veteran-civilian divide and some of the issues in transition, um, I was on a grant uh, in, in the humanities department um, and we were, it, it required an on-stage performance from me, which is not something I had, I don't come from that background, that's not what I do. Um, and it, it was very uncomfortable, but, but it, it's true, that's where those aha moments occur, is when I step out of that comfort zone and let my guard down and connect with an audience about veterans' issues, so often that's when the light bulb goes off, and it was an early experience for me um, on stage, kind of mm -hmm. fusing that. Did you did you process that experience right immediately after you had it, or how did that happen? How do you make sense of it? Um, actually, uh, there were there were a few other veterans on stage with me. We we actually called it therapy, rehearsal therapy, um, and it, it was not necessarily immediate. It was kind of over time um, in looking at that. Um, at what had occurred and starting to make connections when I worked with other veterans and um, what I experienced on stage and what they're telling me about their interactions with, with maybe a, a non-veteran, a civilian population, and, and that's where those connections occurred. Uh, one of the interesting discomforts uh, that came with this art science fusion was in having other scientists engage with their emotions and having them talk about how they feel about their science and how do they feel about their methods or the results or the study organism itself in a, in a discussion with other scientists is something that we just don't do very often uh, unless perhaps we're at a pub with some beers. Uh, so being in a, a classroom discussing that was uh, a clear discomfort, but something that uh, came easier with time and sort of building this, this room where you can really trust each other and just express all ideas equally. So that was, that was really cool to see. What was the trigger to get into the arts for you? For me, I've always been a real appreciator of aesthetics. It's something that's very important to my core values is uh, the beauty of things. Mm -hmm. And I've sort of always been on the side, uh, interested, maybe little arts and hobbies here and there. And later in life, I really understood art and science really aren't that different. Mm -hmm. uh, so because they're just different ways of trying to understand the universe. Uh, so fusing them came more naturally once that barrier in my mind sort of uh, was blurred a little bit more. So some of the questions that are going through my mind as dean of the graduate college is how do we set up institutional practices in universities to nurture these kinds of engagements and even for people who may not have the proclivities to like the arts or do other kinds of genres in their own work. but. We'll get to that question later with all of you. So, um, For me, the greatest discomfort, as I mentioned, I feel that I need to know a little bit about everything. And of course, that knowledge set has to change based on the country or the gender or the sexuality of the person who wrote the text I'm looking at. So for example, the undead, the way they look in China is completely different than in Haiti or than in the US. So for me, I'm always trying to juggle. I always look, there's only so much space in my brain and I have to kind of shut off certain parts and delete knowledge from others. but. I have to sit with that discomfort, and I think that's actually a progressive and productive thing because it forces me to reach out and 
call people like doctors and say, hey, would a dead body do this? Would it do X? And allow for education to happen between disciplines. And I think just being present and even being on this panel and having these conversations is a way to move forward in the future for it to be less uncomfortable and more exciting. What are the kinds of responses you get when you talk about these things? <laughs> uh, um, varied. Uh, I think, and this is another discomfort and attention that I feel, is for older scholars in my field, I'm constantly coming across conflict about, there's always that sort of shock moment, right? When it's like, oh, well, what do you study? And I'm like, monsters. That's literally what I'm getting a PhD in. Yes, I've spent six years doing this. Yes, I can get jobs doing that. Um, just because people, like I said, don't think that it's something serious, that it's something that we should be looking at. And I'm trying to change that, absolutely. But when I actually give presentations, is when I talk to people even one-on-one -on -one or in classrooms about what are you afraid of? What were you scared of as a child? What are you afraid of now? Let's talk about how our idea of a terrorist looks today or how what our idea of a vampire is and what that means. Um, and once you start getting people involved in those conversations and start pointing out the connections, people get really excited. As I mentioned, it's something, we're all afraid of something and monsters are everywhere. So once we start talking about them, I think it actually becomes a uniting force and a way for us to identify with each other. When I was in my PhD program at UVA in the early 90s, I had to take a number of risks. I, my work is on disability policy and I was very eager to understand those issues from anthropological, sociological, historical, philosophical perspectives beyond psychology and education. So I had to take risks to go outside of that program to begin to understand those things at the time when interdisciplinarity was not sexy. And uh, that represented a number of risks I took in my work. It worked out for me because then it became a very important way of engaging our, uh, the, the, the work that scholars do. But I'm wondering about the risks you're taking as you do this work. What kinds of risks are you taking as you do interdisciplinary research and knowledge mobilization? And can you share some examples? And what have been any consequences you might have faced? I guess I can start. Um, kind of going off what I was just saying is my biggest risk is people taking me seriously, talking about what I talk about. Um, so I have to be even hyper vigilant about my knowledge and what I can say. Um, but. <laughs> The biggest thing, I guess, is sticking with it. Um, I actually won a prize for best graduate student paper at an international romantic conference, um, my second year in the PhD program, first conference I'd ever gone to. And so there was a board of people who read every graduate student paper and decided my ideas, my paper was the most successful, it was the best. And so with that was supposed to come a journal publication. And I expanded the article, went through it, my entire committee approved of it, everything was hunky-dory, or so I thought. Um, and the editor of the journal actually refused, even though I was, they were obligated to print my piece, refused to send it even to reviewers. And he actually advised me that I needed to completely shift direction in my research or that it would be a detriment to my career. Um, and that was really hard to hear as someone, geez, like a year out of undergraduate and trying, thinking that what I was doing was the right thing. So honestly, I just had to ignore it, which is hard. And of course, I don't have that publication now. And there's a weird tension there. but. I'm here now, and I've had so many great opportunities following my heart and following my passion. And yes, my dissertation is about vampires and zombies and mummies, and it's awesome and exciting, and I'm here today. So sometimes I think you just have to take the risk, and then even if you get some negative feedback, just keep going. If it's something you're passionate about, you just have to keep pursuing it. What was the objection of the journal editor? Uh, ooh. See, I don't want to get too specific because it was, I don't oh, want anything okay. to No, no, I can say, but I can <clears throat> say is that he was just one of these more old school scholars who didn't think that looking at the undead in poetry, which is what it was about, was a productive way to conceptualize romanticism and gothic genre, which to me, even now, is shocking because, okay, so romanticism is a revolutionary period. You have the American Revolution, you have the French Revolution, you're coming out of the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution is starting. There's a literal uprising of bodies. Bodies from different classes are standing up and going forward. So for me, it's such an obvious connection, but I think he was just closed-minded that he thought it was ridiculous mm -hmm. or not worthy of attention. What carry you through that moment of doubt? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, support from my family and my friends, but also support from my colleagues. Um, my committee, of course, were shocked because they all thought my work was great. Um, and just hearing from other PhD students that, of course, you've been rejected from journals it happens to all of us. There's, you know, like the ghost CV of all the things that we should have gotten publications in. But it, you just have to support yourself with a good community. And I think that, at least for me at ASU, it's so supportive that that's been a really, really easy thing to do. I, I think that that's right. I, 
because for me, one of the biggest risks was even starting on this research path um, in my 40s. You know, I'm not a young doctoral student. I had a, a clinical career working at the Barrow Neurological Institute, among other, other places. And so I, I had this career and taking that risk. Um, and I often think to myself, if I had been at any other university, would I have done it? And I don't know. I don't know because there were a couple of things that converged, one being Arizona State University being one of the top military-friendly campuses in the country. And so there's a large number of military veterans that I was watching this next generation of veterans come in. So it really triggered something in me. Um, but also, you know, just having the, the, the diversity to allow me in my 40s to walk into my first stats class <laughs> and, and feel okay, you know, and, and be able to see that I could succeed. And so okay. um, I, I think that that's, yeah. So tell us more about how you started to broaden your scope of work beyond the specific intervention to get into social issues, emotional issues, labor issues, et cetera. What was that like? What risk did you take? Um, you know, I, I think because I did start with this pretty focused, you know, what's going on? What, why, why, are, why, are I getting, why am I getting all these veterans telling me that they're, mem they're having memory problems or they're having these difficulties? And I started with the, the testing and realized I didn't want to just test my fellow veterans and say, yep, your memory's bad, bye. That was not gonna be okay either. So um, I collaborated. I wrote a, a grant through the Disabled Veterans National Foundation to pay a clinic to let me see the veterans for free. I connected with Disability Resource Services. Um, I connected with people who look at holistic just wellness, yoga, my veterans service organizations, all of these, uh, even, even the leadership in the Pat Tillman Veterans Center, um, my fellow Tillman scholars, um, looking at, at all of those and connecting with disciplines beyond psychology, beyond speech pathology, even into audiology um, to look at, at, at these issues and, and not just how to test it, but realizing I, I I needed to do more than just recognize and praise the problem. Mm -hmm. I needed to do something about it. Do you think your clinical background made it easier for you to do knowledge mobilization? It did. It, it absolutely made it um, easier. I, I look at my, some of my fellow doctoral students, even just within my own discipline, um, being heavily focused um, in a specific area. And although we're all encouraged to translate that research to clinical practice, for me, it, it, was, it, it was just an easy um, and obvious connection. There was no way I could pursue the knowledge I was pursuing and not at the same time try to do something about it. Thank you. Yeah, for me, um, the main risk was teaching an art class. I, I really, uh, I had a lot of experience teaching science, but I didn't know the first thing about teaching <laughs> art. Uh, so, for me, I, I contacted several ASU uh, professors in arts and design, and I met with them one-on-one, -on -one, and I was like, how do you do this? What, do you, what approaches do you take? How do you create an environment where people are comfortable talking about these things and uh, being vulnerable? And you know, how, do you, how do you create this um, timeline? What, how do you give feedback? All these things. So, that was a, a big risk for me, uh, going in front of other, as a scientist, going in front of other scientists and saying, let's all make art. It was, uh, it was new for everybody. So it was, um, but it turned out to be uh, really fulfilling for everybody involved. What did you do to convince the scientists? <laughs> so I think, so here, one of the reasons why I started the, this initiative in the first <clears throat> place is because of talking to my colleagues and realizing that almost everybody has some sort of creative hobby where it's a musician, they play piano or violin or guitar or they paint in their spare time or some, something creative because you know to be a scientist at this level like I said you have to be a creative person and to introduce this idea of oh hey let's take that from your hobby and introduce and fuse that with your own research, a lot of people, I would say about half the people who joined were already sold. Like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. what, what an opportunity to create two of my passions mm -hmm. into one. And the other half of the people hadn't even uh, considered creative hobbies and were just intrigued by 
trying to experience their data in a new way and just sort of jumped on. What did the artists say to you? Oh, the artists, they were, uh, they were really supportive of, of the initiative. I think something in uh, art right now is uh, the influence of science. It is a really big movement throughout all of the fine arts right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, data-driven art, people using numbers to and translating them in different ways through their sculptures, through their paintings, through sound, through composition, um, and so it's kind of a, an exciting time right now to at that where arts and sciences are really influencing the, each other mm -hmm. a lot. Um, yeah. So yeah, the artists were very enthusiastic. That's exciting. So I hope you noticed in Jesse's and Erica's stories on the video that they engage in what we described as interdisciplinary and cultural refinements of their work. Um, can you share with us a, any of the work you've done in terms of refining your own scholarship along the lines of interdisciplinarity and cultural refinements? Have you had any experience doing that in your work? I guess um, for me, it's just based on the audience that I'm speaking to. So I have to approach a film and media class and the knowledge that they have in a completely different way um, than I talk to sixth graders. I mean, those are two completely different things, and you have to make them engaging in different ways. So I think for me, it's more about narrowing down the audience. And the great thing about being a literature scholar is that I do have pretty decent writing skills. So I think it's, and I'm so involved in looking at narratives that it's easy for me to tell a story. And I think. That helps across mm -hmm. every discipline and every audience. As I listen to your story, also I'm mm -hmm. thinking about, you mentioned history as one yes. of the areas in which mm -hmm. you're drawing from. Absolutely. But I hear sociology, political mm -hmm. philosophy. 100%. I mean. As I mentioned, I think that literary scholars are sort of the Renaissance um, scholars of the academy and that we do have to have knowledge of all these things because they come up. I, I like mm -hmm. to say that no person and no narratives exists in a bubble, in a box. Even if the author didn't intend for some message to come through in their text, they're influenced by the world around them, by the things happening politically, socially, culturally, religiously, um, the difference of growing up in one kind of class or community and another. Those things all influence art um, and influence who people become and the narratives that we adapt as our own stories. So yeah, I, it's, it can get complex sometimes, but I think that's what's exciting about it, is being able to explore all these different avenues. Your work engages very controversial issues to some extent, Absolutely. I think. And I'm yes. thinking in terms of cultural refinement, mm -hmm. you may not have any experience yet on this, but I'm thinking as you do representations of gender, Absolutely. race, mm -hmm. class, etc., yes. do people that come from different backgrounds mm -hmm. engage and make sense of that work differently than you? I'm sure, absolutely. I know in, um, so I give a lecture to the film and media classes about queer monsters and the idea of masking and that all monsters are queer and by that I mean non-heteronormative and outside of the norm. And I've had students come up to me saying, hey, you might just want to mention that you're approaching this from you know, a white heterosexual view, which is true. And I'm like, yes, thank you for that criticism. Thank you for that feedback. Um, but even when I teach my classes, I always ask my students what pronoun they prefer to go by. Um, and when I wrote the article about Michonne, who, yes, is a black woman in a comic, um, I did a lot of research about black feminist authors and looking at race relations in the US. And just, so I guess every time I have to widen my knowledge and I just have to keep in mind all the other voices and try to be as respectful of those as possible. I, th I think for me too, I, I, when you think about military culture as, it, as its own culture and you think about the narrative um, in America um, there's this huge civilian cultural divide. And I have to be very mindful of that because the narrative is typically we are either heroes or we're homeless, that we're broken somehow. And this is not true. And yet, a lot of my work touches on some of the things that are not right, that are not going well, that are wrong. And I have to balance that because I don't want to perpetuate that narrative. And I mean, when you, we have the same 1% serving in wars for almost two decades. And they come from the same 1% of families who serve over and over and over again. So this divide is widening. This, the, it isn't just that veterans have difficulty transitioning. I've developed some things for faculty members, understanding the veteran in the classroom, understanding these issues, because it, 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 it goes both ways. You know, the, these, this kind of a um, 
this divide, this difficulty. I have to look yeah. at it from both sides. And I wish we got more of that. As someone who teaches composition, literature, and film and media classes, I've never received any training. Mm -hmm. But I have veterans in every single one of my classes. Mm. So yeah. it's something I would like to see more of at a yeah. university. And as an instructor, I'd like to have, because like I said, I want to make everyone feel as comfortable and be as successful as possible. And, and I think recognizing um, military culture, veteran culture, as, as a culture, recognizing that, I mean, there's, there's beyond the stereotypes. Oh, you served in the military. You have guns. You're a Republican, and you. Yeah, and there's certain things mm -hmm. you're going to get mad. You might flip out on me if I do the wrong. There's certain things that are stereotypical, and so as a culture, I think we endure many of the same things that other cultures do in that regard. So yeah. Dispelling. So that's an interesting tension you're facing in your work. On mm -hmm. the one hand, you're raising awareness about the complexities of the needs and strengths mm -hmm. of veterans, but at the same time, you run the risk of reifying those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Right. What's, how are you navigating that tension? Um, <clears throat> I think that it, you know, I'm always careful to um, think about my audience and think about making sure that, especially when I talk to re researchers, civilian researchers, um, I, I make sure that I, that I showed you some numbers and they don't tell the whole story because um, yeah, I'm a Tillman scholar. Obviously, I have found some ways to be successful. So I, I, I like to make sure I characterize that, but by the same token, I've been to a conference where civilian researchers are presenting information on military veterans, and I heard her say, she was talking about getting them veterans into PTS treatment and talking about their feelings, and she said, you can't expect them to be cold-blooded killers one minute and to talk about their feelings the next. And I was blown away that anybody would ever call us a cold-blooded killer. So mm. I'm very mindful of, yeah. of that narrative. Yeah. Peter. So uh, the cultural refinement that I've tried to cultivate is uh, the scientist talking to other scientists, to the scientists talking to a general public audience um, at an art gallery, or to refine their, their, their own narrative of what they research and define their contribution into a nice, uh, easily digestible story to tell. Um, and that, that refinement takes a lot of time and a lot of iterations to really get at the essence of what, of what we do um, and get that message across easily. So you're participating this week at the National Academy of Sciences in a similar conference, people doing this kind of fusing. Are these issues of cultural refinement and interdisciplinary refinement being addressed in some way? Yeah, there's, there's people of all kinds of disciplines um, looking at the intersection of art, science, engineering, and design, and people talking not just to people in their own field, not just to the public, but broaching, trying to connect engineering and art, trying to connect science and design, and all the, from people trying, from their own culture of their own discipline, and reaching over, and not, not just collaborating with somebody in a different field, but generating whole programs at universities that that meld the two and create uh, people who are trained equally in both. Okay. So that's been really interesting. Great. NSF is also doing some of this work, I believe, in a, in a number of areas. So one last question so we can open it up for a broader dialogue. Um, we learned in the video that serendipity played a role in Jesse's work on bycatch of endangered species and sustainable fishing. Did serendipity play a role in your research and knowledge mobilization work? Has it done it in any way? Um, if yes, how did you handle that? For, for me, I, I kind of go way back to a moment when I got back from um, Desert Storm, and I was with my platoon hanging out, and uh, it was my turn to buy the pitcher of beer. So I threw my ID up on the bar, and there was this older gentleman just kind of staring at me, and I didn't know why, and he said, hey, did you just get back? Did you just get back? And I, I looked at him like, yeah. And he stood up and he came and he put his hand on my shoulder and he shook my hand and he said, well then thank you and welcome home. I'm still emotional about it. Because when I got back from Vietnam, no one ever said that to me and I will not let that happen to you. Like I didn't know this man, we were connected through service but separated by decades and he felt compelled to turn around and make sure that my life as the next generation of veterans was better than his and it's that that seeing these veterans exit service, this next generation, it was, it was that collision in my brain that mm. really 
sparked the motivation to turn around to recognize why isn't it better? Why is it still not better? And to figure out how to turn around and make it better. What a way of getting the message, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's powerful just to go through it yourself. Wow. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> for, for me, uh, serendipity is, is obviously really important for research, uh, making observations and noticing anomalies and following those anomalies and you know, generating a whole dissertation on you know, maybe a single observation that didn't fit in with the rest of your results. But it's specifically about this initiative, serendipity came across specifically when uh, a friend of mine, a colleague who also studies ants at ASU, his mother asked him, why, are you, why, are people, why do people care about this? Why are people dedicating their lives to studying ants? What's, what's up with <laughs> what's that? Up like, with that? <laughs> Uh, which is a question that a lot of us get all, a lot of the time, especially from family members. And, you know, you can approach that, that answer immediately with, oh, you know, studying ants is kind of like studying society and people, and we can generate these solutions to people's society. But really, that's uh, not what motivates me. So I, it took me a couple days to really reflect. And I, my motivation doesn't lie in solving... Uh, societal issues in humans. I'm, I'm just fascinated by the ants themselves mm -hmm. and trying to explore how they function and trying to tell their story of how they fit into this universe. Mm -hmm. and, and that connection I, I acknowledged was sort of similar to the pursuit of art and, and, and literature and, and less about uh, engineering and applied sciences and more of pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. And, and once I acknowledged that uh, sort of boundary is really institutional and not really not real, um, I started this art course the following month. Are you an artist now? <laughs> yeah, I guess Yay. you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, <clears throat> for me, it was entirely serendipitous, uh, although I will say I was raised on horror. Um, some of my earliest memories are sitting in my parents' bedroom while my mom folds laundry, watching like those terrible B sci-fi and horror movies, which I was never scared of, scared of other things, but, and I've always loved horror. I read everything by Stephen King and Richard Matheson by the time I graduated high school, but I never thought that it could be a career. Um, I actually, my undergraduate, I started as with a journalism degree. And I did get a double degree in journalism and English, but English I picked up as my second degree because I was taking so many um, courses just for fun that they were like, this is ridiculous. You need to be doing something with it. And so for me, the true serendipitous moment came when I was just trying to fulfill the requirements of the degree. And I was taking a class on Georgian and England. And then I also took a class on topics in popular culture. And I chose the topics in popular culture, be that one class, because it was a good time for me in the week. And I got there and found out it was about zombies, and which was fantastic. And I went back to my Georgian England class and was reading a poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge called Christabel. And I had this recollection that I was like, this is a zombie. I mean, excuse me, this is a vampire. Like, Geraldine is a vampire. This is happening. And I wrote a paper for that. And luckily, my professor, who I'm still very close with today, was kind enough and said, have you considered going to grad school? This is something you should pursue. And that became my honors thesis, which became my PhD writing sample, which is now my dissertation. Wow. So I've been really, really lucky. But if I hadn't taken those two classes, I don't think I ever would have realized I can make gothic, and I can make horror, and monsters. That can be my life's work. And I'm so passionate about it. I'm incredibly lucky in that way. What an outstanding panel. Let's thank them for their insights. <laughs> Let's open it up for comments and questions. I'm sure you have many. We have plenty of time for discussion. Yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm Michelle Chin. I'm the academic director for the Archer Center, but also a former faculty at ASU oh. um, in political science. So um, it's very interesting to hear your stories and I'm wondering um, you know you just finished talking about serendipity and I'm looking at the title transformative knowledge by design uh, and so I'm wondering in your in your interactions with scholars from other institutions what do you find that's institutionally different at ASU that has allowed you to make these interdisciplinary connections that maybe 
don't exist for colleagues at other institutions? Um, I know for myself, I have, I've actually spoken to other PhD people in the exact same field in Ivy League schools and some of them are leaving having not taught a single class. I have a 2-1 workload. I have taught classes in composition and literature and film and media, which is something I know very few other PhD students in my field have done across the country. Um, and that's provided me with so many opportunities and meeting so many different people. And I've been lucky. We have a really supportive faculty and I have some great people on my committee and they Introduce me. I like to say that I'm stubborn. I just kind of harass people until they like let me do things, um, which is how I ended up with a upper level 494 film and media class. Um, but it's been fantastic, and I think that ASU has so many different unique voices, and there are so many places on campus in ways that you meet people and interact um, that you wouldn't have expected in other ways. Like I'm involved with the Center for Science and the Imagination. Um, and I did that because I introduced myself to the director after watching um, the guy who designed the T-Rex in Jurassic Park to give a talk. So you just, the networking opportunities I think are fantastic, but also being able to teach is crucial to my career. So I really value that at ASU. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of my colleagues, um, when I go to conferences and you know, I talk to, I, you know, I just finished my PhD and so I, I talk to people who are still working on their PhDs or just, just out and within, I come from a background of speech and hearing science, and um, you almost never see the ability to connect with the arts in, uh, in our research and our work. It is very, it is very clinical, um, clinically oriented. Um, but at ASU, we have the Office for Veteran and Military Academic Engagement. Um, Nancy Dillett and Mark Von Hagen run that. And um, they have this incredible ability to bring people together. And it was through that office that that Mark Von Hagen said, you need to meet this person, and that's how the Veteran Project was born, which was that onstage performance early in my PhD. And I think that that is just the, the unique um, personality of ASU. You may end up working with Peter, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, this is, cool. we We've said earlier, about, yeah. one of yeah. the, the coolest things about this is, mm -hmm. is, for me at least, is getting to sit back and go, wow. Mm -hmm. And, and then we've talked about you know, this narrative of, of veterans and the, this idea of monsters and how we, we could, you know, it's incredible. And so it's even this opportunity. Our past would never, never have connected without this opportunity. Nope. And our work all intersects in some really interesting ways that I don't right. think any of us were expecting. So. Right, that aren't even that abstract when yes. you think about it. <laughs> no. Yeah, ASU uh, not only is, is very dedicated to interdisciplinary between program collaborations, but, but actually has whole programs dedicated yeah. to these uh, fusions. Um, and a testament to that is uh, this conference that I'm a part of earlier this week at the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, there were uh, 200 applicants across the world for this conference for graduate students, and 50 were selected. And four of those 50 are from ASU wow. in different programs. So that's, that's really a, a testament to this fusion of arts, science, engineering, and design um, from all angles. Um, each of us had different enough projects that they thought um, would be useful to see all of them. So That's great representation, yeah. Yeah, and, and just like we saw in the opening video, Somebody came up to me and saw my name tag had ASU on it, and they're like, "Oh, wow, ASU! There's some really amazing things going on there. Like, uh, like, tell me about this and that." And you know, it was an invited professor speaker for the for the symposium. Yeah. So, yeah. Did we answer your question? Yes. Please. The mic is behind you. Nope. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, the panelists. I was quite impressed. Mm -hmm. I'm a graduate of the University of Alabama in Birmingham, and I've been in Washington, D.C. now for, I think, about 33 years. I am the founder of the, you see the flyer, the National Association of American Veterans. And uh, this is my 15th year, and yes, there were, um, you know, there was a great need to help the veterans especially those transitioning back into society and those returning that needed that that one-on-one -on -one help. Now I serve on two task forces for the Secretary of VA. Sadly to say the Suicide Task Force, that's over 22 a day, 22. is high among our free female veterans. 
And I'm also working on the Veterans Health Administration Task Force. That's with the Undersecretary of VA. So when they get to me, that means the system has failed. And I work with veterans all over the nation. And the problems are very severe, as you said, with TBI, that's traumatic brain trauma, post-traumatic stress, depression, and suicidal tendency. And I say you can't solve it by giving them eight or 12 prescriptions. And uh, we are body, soul, and spirit. I share that with the task force. I said, where are the VA chaplains on this suicide task force? You just can't give a medication with nothing for the soul and the spirit, okay? We are soul and spirit, body, soul, and spirit. So the next week they had me briefing the top VA chaplains alone. And I think that was an honor, but I went in with a lot of prayer. Was there anything on the panel that uh, your With the attention? panel, I'd like mm -hmm. to hear more from Karen about um, what you're doing in terms of networking with the other VA clinics around the nation and other organizations that yeah. want to do what you're doing. I, I do um, network. I ha so I have a collaboration with a uh, VA researcher in Portland. Um, he kind of came at the problem from a different angle, looking, um, looking at attention issues, which is well within the realm of, of what my work is. Um, but he was motivated when he saw my work by the fact that I could offer some potential solution. So he had been focused on identification of the problem. Um, I do have a WOC appointment to Phoenix VA. If, in case you don't know what WOC is, it's very impressive. It means without compensation. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but this is this is a way to, to network there. Um, of course, the uh, um, I'm, I'm networked with multiple student veteran organizations um, to try and, and really expand what I'm doing because that's the goal is to take what what I'm doing and and get it out there and to expand it so yeah those collaborations are are definitely in, in place thank you for your service to this country thank you for your support Suzanne would you like to say something about the grad impact initiative that is very aligned with this uh, sure but but whoops but first I just want to say thank you Alfredo for your leadership and graduate education and thanks for thank this you. opportunity to meet three absolutely remarkable graduate students and, and recent PhDs. So thanks for your inspiration and thanks for the work you do. Um, let me tell you, I'll try to keep this short, but the impulse for grad, graduate imp, grad impact um, really started with something a public policy official told me years ago and it was this. Um, facts are absolutely essential, but public policy is made by stories. Um, and so really, um, as the Council of Graduate Schools, we were interested in um, harnessing the stories of the work that people are doing in graduate school that is changing families and changing community lives. So um, it is an attempt to showcase precisely the kind of work that was modeled here. I mean, a national forum, we are in the process of both using that, um, enabling our graduate deans to use it as a tool locally and as they work with um, national um, legislators. Um, and, uh, and so that was the initial impulse. What I think it has turned out to be is a real opportunity to model for students what is possible with their work as well. Yeah. Um, I think I'd like to pass the microphone to Catherine Hazelrig, who is actually um, the person who makes this all work to see if there's anything she'd like to add or a note on logistics. And you'll be getting three impact stories very soon. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Catherine Hazelrig. I'm the Assistant Director of Communications at the Council of Graduate Schools. Um, thank you all for your presentations. They were amazing. Um, as Suzanne said, the project started um, really kind of as a way to tell um, our larger communities about the importance of graduate education to demonstrate its place as a public good to society. Uh, and so we feature a, a student or recent alum about every week, excuse me, and tell the story of the kind of research that they are doing. Um, and one of my goals, uh, as also a background in English, is to focus on kind of the narrative of yeah. the story 
And it, um, what impressed me so much about your presentations today is that you are communicating to a very broad audience, and I think that's something in higher education that we uh, could all improve upon a bit. And so um, I actually do have a question in terms of the work that you do. How did you um, learn to do that? Was it training that you got at ASU? And do you have advice on how others can do that well? Um, a, a lot of it does come from um, training at, at ASU. I think that um, I got, I personally got a lot of support and had the opportunity to tell my story in, in to the media. I think, you know, um, ASU orchestrated a lot of that for me um, to give me some visibility for the work. There was really big support of that. Um, Salute to service is a big thing at ASU, and so uh, President Crow uh, invited me to his president's tailgate to tell my story a little bit. So I had lots of opportunity for that, but I think some of it also comes from just that internal motivation of, of passion of seeing the story in, in what you do. And for me, there's no way to disconnect what I do from my story. There's just, they're inextricably linked. And so, um, I, I, I mean, I, given the opportunity to practice it a lot <laughs> is, one thing, is one thing that ASU did do, but the, the story was, was there, I think, so. Yeah, um, I think ASU has a lot of really good outreach opportunities for scientists. Um, and one, one specific way in which uh, storytelling is honed in uh, what I do is I invited, one of the guest artists and designers I invited was uh, a professor at the design school at ASU. And she gave us a presentation, all of us in this class, about storytelling. And uh, you know, what she does is, is very visual, maybe even static, you know, like images, single images designs, like how can you tell a story with an image? Um, what is a story? What makes a story good? How do, what makes us remember stories? Uh, and those really simple things that she told us, I think, carried with us. Um, and it, the, the really important thing is uh, the way that I present my research, uh, it doesn't, I, I tell the same story no matter if I'm at a conference full of other people studying ants or if I'm talking to first graders. It's, it's just which details, uh, how, how deep do I delve? But that, that essential story is so important to like, bre like hold the scaffolding of how people understand uh, the narrative of your, of your own research. And that's just so important, no matter who you're talking to, um, specialists in your field or not. Uh, for me, I definitely think my background in journalism helps in that I had <laughs> I used to be breaking news editor and news editor, so I was forced to come up with these stories in such brief and concise terms, so that's definitely helped me. But I tell all my students, you need to read more and you need to write more. I don't think that you can be a good speaker or that you can be a good writer in any discipline unless you do those two things. So, and another thing that ASU's provided me is, as I mentioned, all these disciplinary opportunities and I've taken classes in things outside of my Field. And I think that's important. I would like to see in higher education a movement, even for PhD students and master's students, to be required to take at least three credit hours in two fields that are outside of their own, just to be exposed to new people, exposed to new ideas, and to start making those connections between different disciplines and different ideas. So if we were to capture all the wisdom you shared with us mm -hmm. today and offer something, a laboratory, a studio experience, a seminar, what would that look like? What would you recommend students to do in that play? I mean, if you were to teach that yeah. seminar, what would you do in that seminar that would be critical, consequential mm -hmm. for doc students? I, I think it would be one of the critical pieces, at least, yeah. would have to be putting together people who don't necessarily want to be put together who don't necessarily share a background, a philosophy, don't share ideas, don't even share passions, um, but to, to force, I mean, we get so parochial, we get just so, you know, um, cocooned in, in our own uh, discipline that, you know, having these opportunities um, are, are, are 
valuable beyond words. And so I think putting people together who would never have met and, and who, who don't share any interest and, and, and helping them find a way to, to fuse their work or to find meaning in their own work from the other person's work is, is at least, I think, a critical piece. Yeah. I agree. And I think thinking in terms of like assignments and projects to pair up with another person in the class in a completely different field and be like, okay, you have five minutes or ten minutes, explain to me as a med student why I should care about monsters. To have literally have them come up with a paper or a presentation that forces them to explain their work to a completely different audience would be important. I think that there needs to be opportunities for teaching. I think there needs to be, I think even co-teaching. I think that could be really fascinating as maybe taking a scientist and a lit student and like an art and like teaching, let's look at veteran narratives and war stories and investigate them from two different perspectives. Let's look at science and medical texts and even scientific journals and see what emerges in there that everyone can relate to. I think that could be really productive as well. So co-teaching and just having experience writing and speaking to a different audience. And you know, even being now in my role as clinical faculty, when I work with students who are working with brain injured patients and they want to report on their patient to me, I get a lot of facts about how many months post onset, you know, right hemisphere traumatic, stop. What is your patient's story? This is a human being in front of you. You need to know those things, but you also need to know what's their story, what's their problem, what is it you're seeking to solve? What one thing can you look at this human being and say, you know, if I had to weigh the relative contribution of all these deficits to the overall life, quality of life of this human, what is it? Tell me that story. And I think it's opportunities like that. Yeah. Being sensitive to those dimensions, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, one thing, one really specific example that I, I would include in this seminar, of course, is pairing people up that necessarily don't have the same background in philosophy, having them explain their research to each other. And then this is something I actually did in the course, which is, I think this was my favorite assignment. Then I had their partner write a little story from their, from their partner's perspective about how they felt about their research. Like how, how would you imagine you feel about this research? Or it could be really anything, but like putting, not just like understanding their research, but trying to come at it from their, a deeper perspective yeah. of your, the person who just explained this thing to you. And then they swap stories and they're funny and it's like, oh, what, this is crazy. Or like, oh my God, this is dead on. Like, I can't believe you knew that. Or it's, yeah, this, so yeah, that was, I think I would definitely continue that. And I think what we're all highlighting here is the idea of storytelling and of sharing, of sharing ideas. We can't like exist in this ivory tower and expect that everyone's going to care about our one little thing and to make it connecting, like to find ways to make like a web of knowledge rather than just a straight line. Beautiful. A few more minutes for questions. Oh, that's such a hard question. It's like, who's my favorite child? <laughs> what was um, the question? Who's my favorite monster? And there's so many, I'd have to say, like, type of would, the undead, obviously. So I categorize the undead as any tangible corporeal being that was once technically dead and now reanimate. So ghosts don't count. Um, but yeah, zombies, vampires, mummies. But I think there's so many different, and I mentioned this before, like culture and history. Frankenstein's creature obviously has a world of his own. But like the idea of the chupacabra, or even the idea of like the Lamia and these, there's, um, I believe it's China's, but don't quote me on this. There's, their undead is literally like jumping corpses. They just think everyone like jumps in a little line to like get to the place they need to. And I just find all monsters fat. What's your favorite monster? I never liked monsters. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't, yeah. yeah. But that's okay. I think that even we're still afraid of something. So even if that monster doesn't look like a body that is physically monstrous or that we should be scared of, Maybe it's the dark, maybe it's spiders, maybe, um, I know I have a fear, I was just telling Karen, of like elevators falling. That's still a fear, we all mm. have fears. Felice, you've been wrestling with a lot of these things over the years, what are you thinking? <clears throat> had part of my career line at the National Science Foundation. I was also executive director of the American Sociological Association, so you could see I'm a bridge, interdisciplinary bridge builder. And I think across the science societies, as well as the higher ed associations, we've all been um, challenged and engaged with public engagement and better ways of communicating. I think the storytelling is a very gripping way of stimulating others to 
understand and share. And I wondered, so let me ask a question, how uh, uh, with Karen, um, it was very obvious how the modality actually affects your scholarship, affects your science, in addition to ways of communicating what you're doing. Uh, I wondered with all of you how you would see this experience then as transforming the scholarly enterprise you're involved in. Part of why I'm asking that is that we've been actually doing an AERA public discussion fora uh, where we involve policy and practice communities with a little bit of a, as you all did, a little bit of an ed talk. Mm -hmm. And what we find is how much that's enriched our own work among the scholars who participate. So I'm very interested mm -hmm. in that interaction between the kind of knowledge production that you're engaged in as well as the modalities of effective communication, if you yeah. could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, so um, I think... You know, that's the hardest one with ants, you know. Yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think in general, um, and you can correct me if I'm not coming at this with the right angle, but um, having scientists look engage with their data in, in a completely new way, whether it's the actual numbers of a data set um, encoded in the color of the paint, or, um, or if it's more of just a, the narrative of their story, in, of their research, and represented in a different way. It can, it can often lead to different ways of thinking about uh, what it means, and like, academically, w what is this contributing? Um, seeing maybe a little anomalies that they didn't notice before or um, really engaging a creative side with things that they've discovered um, that then kind of bounce back into, oh, wow, wait, asking questions about what might take this further or, you know, for, for a really specific example of my own research, I've uh, another project of mine, I, I've taken uh, where the ants live inside of the tree, and I've turned that into like a little musical so uh, song for each tree. And just listening, you know, closing your eyes and listening, I've uh, discovered patterns that I didn't know were there before. I didn't, I didn't you know, an X, Y scatter plot didn't show me um, this interaction between variables. And I looked into it deeper, and it's now a, a new talking point in the paper that I'm going to publish. So, so if I could just insert, and then you can go back. Yes. I think it's a wonderful kind of example to feed back to the scientific community is that this process, in and of itself, stimulates new ways of examining your own problem. That's right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I was just going to. I, I was just going to add that this specific process here of coming and talking to you um, and thinking about the, the, these principles, these ideas of um, access and use and impact. And telling my story is one thing, but really focusing it on how, how do I make it accessible? How is it usable on a broader scale? And, and how can I make a bigger impact? has definitely shaped some ideas for me of, of where I need to go next. So just going, even though I was, I was there and I had ideas and I was already working and doing these things and these plans, I think forcing me to put these, these ideas into ways that I could express it to all of you and to think about these things that we're talking about um, today um, really elevated me in my thinking and, and, and the action that I'm going to take moving forward. For Thank me, you again. Oh. We're almost out of time. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no worries. Yeah, I was, yeah, was going to say, um, for me, I think it's really important to, as scholars, and I consider myself to be like a public scholar, that's what I strive to be. Not because, we were talking about this, I don't want to have a TV show because I have any desire to be famous. I actually am very hesitant about even appearing things like this and having my photo plastered everywhere and just opening yourself to that kind of criticism. But I think in today's day and age, especially even looking at statistics you were showing us, there's so much happening with technology and the internet and television that if you don't have a presence and a voice there, you might get lost in the fray. So for, that's one of the reasons I wrote for Slate Magazine um, and it got a lot of page views, which is fantastic. And I've been asked to write for them again and I certainly plan on doing so. But all of that gives you more recognition, more opportunities. And I also plan on going to other middle schools or high schools and talking to kids about getting them excited about education and like look at this cool 
thing you can learn about in a fun way, maybe you should consider doing that in the future. Um, in terms of my actual research and how that sort of moved and mobilized knowledge there, um, my work with mummies actually led me down a very interesting path to the idea of how female bodies are portrayed in medical texts. So one of my future um, projects is actually to look at the female corpse in scientific textbooks and illustrations and examine how gender is portrayed in those ways, yeah. Thank you again to our panelists. Let's uh, show our appreciation. We're going to stay for a few minutes if you want to connect with the panelists. I, I want to remind you that we need your feedback. Please take a couple of minutes to fill it out, and Jennifer will pick it up on your way out. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from you again. I want to get a